Poem 181 The saddest noise, the sweetest noise, the maddest noise that grows. The birds, they make it in the spring, at night's delicious close. Between the March and April line, the magical frontier, beyond which summer hesitates, almost too heavenly near. It makes us think of all the dead that sauntered with us here, by separation's sorcery, made cruelly more dear. It makes us think of what we had and what we now deplore. We almost wish those siren throats would go and sing no more. An ear can break a human heart as quickly as a spear. We wish the ear had not a heart so dangerously near. The saddest noise, the sweetest noise. Like many of Dickinson's works, this poem depicts an ambivalent relationship with the external world. In this case, it's with nature. Dickinson uses nature as her core conceit to illustrate life and death and her fear of both. Here we see the depiction of a very traditional topic for composers, the Reverdi, an ancient celebration of springtime. Spring connotes new life and the regreening of the earth. Dickinson, in her usual, or should I say unusual way, chooses to subvert this classic convention and presents a moment that should be full of joy and excitement for renewal, renewal with a sombre tone. Again, we see our composer not belonging to the experiences others find binding. <clears throat> she finds the sounds of spring simultaneously sad and sweet, conveying an interesting binary opposition with which her readers are challenged. Her poem, like the seductive melody of the sirens, allure us to a dire end. As a result, she perhaps does share a universality with the world beyond her room, that all who live will die. So let's break it down. Stanza 1 presents us with auditory imagery to introduce the core conceit. Nature represents the life cycle here. The repetition of noise suggests a negative perspective of springtime. Spring and life is noise, something heard but incomprehensible. The tricolon, saddest, sweetest, maddest noise, presents an uncertain attitude towards belonging. The birds they make it in the spring introduces a second conceit which depicts the passing of seasons and the idea of changed and coupled with the final line reveals the relentless progression of time. Life begins, then one dies, night, then life begins again in an endless cycle. Her unorthodox choice of delicious again gives us paradoxical ideas about life and existence. Night is dark and frightening, and yet rebirth at night's end is sensorially delightful. In stanza two, the common meter creates a feeling of cohesion and fluidity illustrating the shared experience of life. The metaphorical line paints the boundaries to relationships and the barriers of the natural world. The magical frontier with the motif of magic and military imagery conveys the battle to connect and its elusive quality. 
the enjambment to the next line where summer is personified illustrates growth and maturity in the life cycle and suggests summer's reluctance to experience this growth. The stanza closes with a hint of irony, suggesting death is approaching and yet describing this moment as of transcendental beauty in the choice of word heavenly, perhaps signifying the yearning to connect to nature and yet the necessity to accept that to wholly be part of nature, one must die. The third stanza begins a transition. Where previously Dickinson presented her conflict with nature and life, her links and her alienation, she now begins to specify and become less ambiguous about what concerns her. Interestingly here, she also begins to use inclusive language, highlighting confidently the shared experience of losing a loved one and the pain of recollection. In the opening lines, she reasons why spring is sad. It reminds the persona of the dead, those that she loved, now lost. The binary opposition here depicts the paradox of life and death. The sibilance and magic motif repeated here work together, showing the nature of human bereavement with hypnotic enchanting lyricism highlighting the bitterness of loss and cruelty of making emotions more potent for those gone with the passing of time. Stanza 4 this stanza continues to highlight the sense of loss that spring assists the persona to recall. Inclusive language continues to elaborate on the composer and responder's shared experience. The use of past and present tense had and now creates a sense of time in contrast and the past affecting present life. The mythological allusion to the sirens forms an image of seduction. We are drawn to belonging despite the painful consequences. The songs stir memories of belonging and not belonging and the homophonic allusion of, uh, of sing no more to sin no more suggests the powerful desire for such pain and relationships to end. Stanza 5. The final stanza completes this bittersweet anthem to spring. The synecdoche in the first line Ear being life and love forewarns its readers that it is the fate of the human condition that to live is to expect to be broken. The auditory experience is devastating. The simile on the next line highlights the intangible being as lethal as the tangible spear. The closing lines of the poem leave the reader with a whimsical desire to not be harmed by life's relationships. The anatomical terms suggest the transcendental effects of the physical. So there you have it, the saddest noise, the sweetest noise, life, love, pain and loss, the noise of existence, the desire to connect and the impossibility to do so because of nature's vast power, omnipotence and immortality. 
Dickinson presents vividly her anguish in living as a unique individual. So why is she such a recluse? Perhaps the answer lies within these lines. To belong is to acknowledge your own mortality and that of those you love.